Hi, folks. Uh, this is Bob flying solo again for the Bob and Ramon show. Uh, tonight, I'm delighted uh, to have Ash Wilson join me. Hi, Ash. Hi, Bob. How are you? Hi. Uh, um, now, a couple of things first, because you're going to ask me, I know, on the video, why am I dressed like Captain Haddock? <laughs> well, the answer is because I just had some stuff done to my house and the new bit is really beautiful and warm. And that's my, where my wife is. I'm in the front of the house in my office. Oh, man. I've got no fucking heating. Oh, no. So, so I look like I'm, 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 I'm camping out. So th we've got the Captain Haddock bit out of the way, right? All, all the <laughs> I didn't notice, actually. I, did, I didn't notice. I, I thought you looked very And, and you, you're, you're up in Lincolnshire, aren't you? Yes. Where it's probably extremely cold. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, luckily, my wife's a farmer, so she's, uh, she's got a, a big truck, so we can get about, because right. the snow's just been completely... I've not seen snow like it in 15 years. And, I mean, you, you're well into the minuses. We're, prob we're probably hovering around. I mean, they say tonight's going to be the coldest night of, of the year and probably the coldest night for several years. But, but you're well into the minuses out there, aren't you? We are, yes. I think, I think last night, it, they said with the wind chill, it would feel like minus 18. Um, but it's, it's strange, you know, because I find, I don't know if you find it's the same where you are, but what, I find it, it feels cold when it's about three degrees, but raining and damp. Right. I okay. find damp cold in England, very cold. Whereas this cold, you put a coat on. Right. Good. Right. Okay. Although it's a bit out of order, I have to ask you, because it's a great segue. You did a gig a few years ago near the North Pole. And I'm fascinated oh, yeah. by that. Was, did, was it on Svalbard? It was, yes. I would, although I hate the cold, I'd love to see that place. It's, it's got to be one of the weirdest places on the planet. It's very strange, you know. You get it's 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 an absolute nightmare to get to. It's four yeah. flights um, over about twenty six hours. So what they do, you're there for five days, and you do. We did about four shows in that time, and it is jamathon. Svalbard is tiny. There's two thousand people there, and five hundred of them are kids at school, of the people who are working doing, okay. um, you know, okay. looking at glaciers and and studying polar bears and whatnot. So. Um, you, you, we were really lucky. We got a great tour guide who who showed us around the place because they actually mine coal there. That's why there's a settlement on right. the Svalbard. Um, it's very pure coal, although there's only one active mine there now. See, I know you see we got a good guide, and right. um, and and there's about three venues. There's a town hall and there's a couple of bars. And it's just, it, it's insane. You, you all fly to so say the last flight, all of you are together, all the musicians. So it's just a plane full of musicians. Everyone's got guitar on and bass is on and whatnot. And um, you, uh, you arrive, you go to your hotel and it's dark all the time. So there's literally no daylight other than for like an hour where it's a wow. Bit. So yeah, oh, there's no, the sun never comes over the horizon it just sort of gets a bit dusky a bit dawny a bit dusky yeah that's what you get that little bit of like vanilla-y kind of looking pinky hue in the sky <laughs> okay. the golden hour for an hour and then yeah. it's pitch dark again but it's amazing because obviously it's for, it was about minus 15 all the time yeah um but again it's that dry cold so because right. i'm the same as you man i'm I, I can't stand i've always got tons of layers on it there's no local Svalbardians as such everyone's from all over the world yeah so um you know it's it's everyone luckily for us everybody spoke English so, so how, how did you how did you get the, a gig there I mean I don't know anybody else has played there uh oh you'd be surprised actually the, uh, I mean I I first found out about it through because my brother did it the year before we did with Lawrence Jones and they have this dark season blues festival where they book bands from all over the world. It's not just the UK, all right. over. And um, so there's about 60 musicians all at the same time on at this festival that um, that do gigs and they do jam sessions as well. So you can end up playing with um, people that... I did a jam with some guys who didn't even speak English, um, which is a whole amazing language of music thing. They're, they're Brazilian. My Spanish is pretty bad. Their English was, was was pretty bad, so but you know we just started playing and it, and it was incredible and they and they were wow, just incredible musicians. They were phenomenal, and um, and it was like that all the time. Everything we saw, 
all the musicians, every act they booked were great and loads of diversity as well. But I mean, I don't know how we got that show. I mean, it was, I was, I w- it wasn't one of my own gigs. I was working with, um, with the singer called Sari Shaw that I've been working with for about three years. I'm very jealous. So I've been listening back because I, I guess we ought to say, tell, tell the, the people who are watching this, how we met. So you're, sure. sitting, you're sitting next on, to your left hand, as we look at it, you're sitting next to a rather nice amplifier. Right, yes. Oh, I'll, I'll move my... Uh, a 633 Groove King, I think. It is, yes. The one that I haven't got. Oh, okay. right. yeah. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we, really both, we both independently know Cliff Brown, who makes these wonderful amps. Yes. And the first time we met was actually when you were supporting um, uh, uh, Dan Patlansky. Dan Patlansky, that's right, yeah. Uh, in London. And yeah. I went with a couple of mates, and we got there, you know, fashionably late, halfway through your set, thought, bollocks, I wish we'd got here in time. This is fantastic. And oh, towards the I end of the set, it. I said to one of them, I said, I recognise that sound. That's because I'm a very derivative guitarist, Bob. That's- no, <laughs> it wasn't that. It wasn't that. I, I thought, this, this nice sound. So anyway, we t- sidled up to the stage like good old fanboys do. And there was your amp. <laughs> anyway, so there we were. And so I came and introduced myself. And... Uh, you, we've kind of caught up on occasion ever since, and I've been sort of brushing up on your uh, your album, Broken Machine. Okay, yeah. and I've forgotten how bloody brilliant it is. No, oh, it's I mean, really kind of you. Man. I mean, there's you know, there's, there's all sorts of playing, but one thing I noticed going back to it, I was kind of trying to work out who your influences are because we're a generation apart. Yeah, and, sure, sure. And yet we all kind of seek the same North Stars. But it's interesting that you say, you know, you've got your strap with you tonight. Because when I listen to you, I definitely hear a guy who is at his most comfortable on a strap. Sure. It, it, you, you get the bottom end and you get that great sort of throat and growl and curl around the note and all the stuff that a strap does. Sure. You know, really. I mean, is, is, is that fair or am I, am I pigeonholing no, no, you? No, 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 definitely. Like because you play those much- balls too. I do, uh, and, and I, I'm between Les Pauls at the moment, actually. Um, but I, I mean, I'll play. If I had more cash, man, I'd, I'd have one of everything. You know, I mean, it, <laughs> it, 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 the the infamous gas uh, problem that we've all that we're all afflicted with. Yeah, I really like Strats. I think because I started out, I said to my dad, "Oh, I've played this guitar, and um, I, think, I think I think I'd like one." And he was like, "Oh, definitely. Let's let's buy one of those instead of a PlayStation." Um, so he started force feeding me these VHS tapes of Clapton and Gilmore and it, and, and actually a Genesis video that's got and they, and um, Daryl Sturm is playing Stratocaster on that and, right. and Rutherford. So the, these three live concerts really were kind of like what got me into guitar music and the common denominator was the Stratocaster. Yes. So I, I wanted a I wanted a strap and I didn't know what it was called. And, and, you know, there's no internet back then. There's no, it was, it was, there's guitar magazines and stuff. So I am um, now to my 13 year old brain, I have no idea what that is, but then just the sound Fender Stratocaster. And, yeah, yeah. Comes home and he's like, Oh, you want a Fender Stratocaster? And I'm like, I do what I definitely want a Fender Stratocaster <laughs> just because of the name. So I ended up with a Squire strap. And uh, Maple Fretboard, because Gilmore and Clapton were the guys I was, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're the guys I'm into at, at that time. And and then I heard Kenny Wayne Shepherd on the radio. So I, I'd started learning, um, learning Apache and Hank, a lot of Hank Marvin yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, and there's one guitar player in Skegness at the time that I knew of. So, and he was a massive shadows head. So that was what we learned because that was all he could teach me. That was, that was, that was what he knew. So, so, which was great because he got me playing melody really early on. Yeah. And, um, and yeah, he was really patient, really lovely guy. And then I heard Kenny Wayne Shepherd. He'd just released uh, Trouble Is. So I think it was his second album. And I, again, blues, I didn't really know. You know, Clapton to me was, oh, that's, well, that's blues music, you know, because I, I, I didn't really know. Yeah. And, um, he had a sunburst strap 61 i think so i'm like oh that's amazing and then you know i get chatting to my dad and he's like, oh one of my favorite albums when i was growing up was irish the irish tour or rory gallagher i'll buy it so he, he bought it on cd because all these vinyls have been lost years ago and again a little bit of sunburst left on it yeah sunburst strap rosewood board so i'm like oh 
that's what I need. So I worked. Um, this is an adult show, right? Yeah. Okay. I can divulge the following information then. <laughs> I worked in a sex toy shop in on Skegness Seafront. For okay. <laughs> uh, didn't do any demonstrating. I just sold. I sold a lot of large implements to some very uncomfortable looking chaps <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> during the, well, I was only about 15. I mean, it's so. gone mass market now. You can buy them anywhere. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, and now it's, it's no big at all, is it? It's just completely just wandering to, you know, you saunter into Ann Summers and everyone's in there, you know, oh, is this, and this one has got the turbo mode. Um, so I, um, so yeah, I did that and I saved up and what my parents said was, okay, because uh, I was really taking, you know, I've been playing about a year and a half now, and I was really, and my music teacher at, at school was really behind me, you know, carrying on and, and, and maybe going to music college because I wasn't particularly interested in school. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I did all right, but I needed great, but I just spent, I just wanted to play guitar all the time. So they were like, okay, well, we'll invest in a new guitar. And, 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 I, and I, as I discovered when I got it, I didn't actually need a new guitar. It was, the, it was a new amp I needed. <laughs> Because I thought, oh, well, if I buy a Fender Stratocaster, I'll sound, I'll be able to get those Kenny Wayne Shepherd tones and those Rory Gallagher tones. And, and that, that didn't happen. I had a, had a, a valve that, state. That's really interesting. So you learned another lesson that most guitarists don't learn in a lifetime. And it took me most of my lifetime to right, learn. Right, sure. Which is, yeah. it's the amp. The amp, mate. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, I, I've often said to, to students, actually, you know, don't don't throw tons of money at, uh, at, at an instrument. You, you want something that that really stays in tune. You can intonate, and do you want single coils or do you want humbuckers? And 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 really, the amp will do. And especially if you buy, you know because um, you can get decent little drive pedals to do impressions of other amps and stuff. You can get great, yeah. you know, nowadays you can get a great setup for a few hundred quid and, yeah. you, and yeah. you get a really great sound. Absolutely. So, so I, I got, I, my parents matched them and I got a 62 reissue strap for about 800 quid um, from Coda Music, which weirdly is where I always end up buying my guitars um, or Andertons, but, but for some reason I always end up, in, in fact, I got this from Coda. Let's pause and stuff. I was well into like Slash. You said in your um, yeah, message. I, I I could hear a bit of Slash in there. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think um, he's. I think Slash is probably the last of the great Les Paul players. I think he's amazing. He's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, and, and I think I think what the thing with it with it, with Slash is is all is almost an icon rather than a, a guitar hero now. I think isn't he? You only need to see his silhouette with the hat and and everything else and. He, the romance, I suppose, of rock and roll is, isn't is what it was, I don't think. I think our pop stars nowadays are a lot more accessible than they were yeah. back when we were, you know, when we were younger. And, and, and someone like Slash, who had such a distinctive look and he plays guitar really low down. But so, low so, so there you are. And by now, you're probably just playing and playing and playing and all the rest of it. You're getting together with some mates and doing bands and stuff. But yeah, when, yeah. When, are you, when are you then making the transition about, you know, shit, this is serious? Well, I, I started a band at college, uh, out of college. So all the, all the guys at college wanted to be in Jamiroquai when I was... Okay. And, and case in point, great band, really funky. But I really wanted to play solo. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, of course, there weren't many solos. There's lots of really great rhythm chops and, 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 and stuff like that. But for me, it was just like, oh no, I, I want to play, I want to play blues. I want to play, you know, I was getting to Peter Green and my guitar, well, he wasn't really the guitar tutor. There was a, the rehearsals tutor at college was a guy called Ray Fennick, who- Oh was yes. Just one of the best guitarists in the country, I think. Yeah. And uh, Ray was playing as all this like Peter Green stuff and, and you know, a Steely Dan and I know, which obviously it's, it's not blues rock, but, this is really cool guitar playing in it. Yeah. So, so it. I, I really wanted to be, and I wanted to put something together where I could express myself. And I had a weekend job in a, in a kitchen washing pots. And one of the chefs used to listen to Metallica. Guns and Roses was about as rocky as I as it got for me. Okay, really. like anything, anything sort of beyond that um, didn't didn't do it for me at the time. So I, you know, I sort of gingerly approached this chap. Uh, he's a bit older than me, and he was a chef. And he really played into the stereotype of angry, hostile, don't come near me, I'm, you know, sweating <laughs> from every pause. Yeah. Shit. But I knew he played drums. So I was like, I'll ask him, I'll see if he was. And he was like, yeah, I know a guy who plays harmonica. 
And I was like, what? It's amazing. Yes. Bring him along. And um, I, a friend of mine did some hunting around and found a, a local bass player. And we went and had a rehearsal. And the harmonica player turned up with a Stratocaster and an amp. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I'm the guitarist. <laughs> I'm the guitar player around here, kind of thing. And uh, Trev, Trev Betterson, who, who's, who you, I don't think you'll have heard of. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't, he sort of only really plays locally around here, but Go what ahead. a incredible blues musician. Like really just authenticity absolutely personified in that guy for blues. He's, he plays harp. Um, you, you know, in in that he gets he gets all those that great visceral distortion out of it when he plays, mm. and um, and he plays you know he plays lovely lovely guitar. You know, he's he's, he's a big Muddy Waters fan and BB um, King fan, and he plays he although he's, he's left handed, but he plays a right handed guitar. So he's got a very aggressive vibrato. Same as me. Uh, yeah, man. And, and there's there's a there's a there's a there's a tension to that vibrato that I, I really love. And right. he started, he started playing guitar and I just like, Oh, what on earth? I might as well go, you know, like this guy's just some, something else. So we really complimented each other. Well, cause I came at it more from a rock angle yeah, and he came at it more from a blues angle in between us. And, and, and it took off really quickly. We went, we, we had a lot of lineup changes, but Trevor and I remained pretty consistent and we put an album out. We did it. We self-financed a record and we did, um, we did okay, you know. We came down to London and we did some shows, and in the end, as 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 young guys do, you know, we have three years later, we're about twenty, and we all fell out. Right. So we had this big European tour booked, and we we you know that we all we all just fell out with each other over egos, right? And money, really, money was the big thing. Yeah, so actually, we we I mean, we were earning sort of. I think by the end of it, we were on like seven eight hundred quid a show. And we were playing a lot of shows, so there was plenty of money in there. But but this European tour didn't have, we didn't have any guarantees. So my argument was, well, whatever we get, we should just split four ways. And the one of the individuals in the in the group had, had you know taken out a mortgage or whatever, and he was like, well, I need more, I need this guarantee. And I kind of limped along for a bit after that, to be honest. I did, I did, I put a band together with my brother. Uh, and uh, Greg Smith, who, who, who's, who, who was uh, Lawrence Jones's bass player for a couple of years, and uh, we we did all right. We did a bit, but we were quite we weren't very bluesy, but we were playing on the blues scene. And I had made friends with a guy called Wayne Proctor in the interim time, a drummer, and who just started producing young bands. And uh, he uh, he sort of took us under his wing and got me into songwriting and as, as a part you know, before this i used to just play a song to get to the solo yeah and then i just play as much pentatonic as i could over the top of that and then eventually the singer would sing again <laughs> and i'd have to i'd have yeah. to stop so um I, that's about where i'm stuck that's about where I've got to <laughs> yeah, that, that, that video i saw the other day i was i was most impressed with your playing <laughs> It 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 was a it was a bit of a it was it was a, it was a wake up call for me you know I really wanted to um, I, all of a sudden it was like oh lyrics were important and chord progressions were important and at the same time as that I I met um, I met met my wife so I ended up doing a teaching degree and got into teaching for a couple of years so I taught at a music college for about five years um, which was amazing actually because I met on the teaching staff and actually some of the students were incredible as well so more incredible musicians who influenced me in different ways yeah, and yeah. brushed my music theory up which into... college was it it was a, it was a local one just at lincoln right um, called access to music there's tons of them sort of i think they're called access creative college now they they've become like a um more of a they've had to branch out into yeah video game programming and stuff so right. when i was there it was just a music college where we right did. got it i mean i started off just doing guitar lessons and ended up sort of holding lessons on you know music journalism and all sorts it was it was a really amazing learning curve and i got an opportunity to join a band uh right when we were planning to get to get married so claire and i've been together for about 10 years and um, my brother had played drums for a guy called sean webster who used to be based in the uk but he's based in the netherlands now an amazing singer like wow you know really great voice 
uh, and and a, a good guitarist as well. To be fair to him, it didn't really need me. <laughs> but um, they decided they wanted a guitar player, and um, and my brother sort of put my name forward. So for a, for about a year, I, w- I did I gigged in Holland every weekend, and then drove back, and then went to work, and I'd be sort of teaching from nine on a Monday morning, having got back at about quarter to nine. It was insane. I did that for a year. And then as we were planning to get married, my wife, who was like the most understanding, amazing person on the planet, because she she was a like a pro hockey player when I met her. So I think she kind of understood that I still had the bug to. Yeah. I really want to, you know, I sort of got to like 26. I'd never really done a proper tour longer than a week. And I, you know, I really wanted to sort of cut my teeth, as it were, playing live. And, and so she was like, oh, why don't you just do the Sean thing? So I did like two years with Sean and we played all over, all over Europe. So I'd sort of gone from never really playing anywhere further than Lincoln. Well, London, I suppose a couple of times, but not really ever going that far. And, and how many gigs are we talking about? A pretty, pretty busy schedule. Yeah, it was a busy schedule at one point. Yeah. I mean, one year we did, we did a, we must've done a 150, 200 shows or something. You know, we were doing, we were, we were over in right. Poland, Austria, you know, I mean, Luxembourg, it was, it was a mad, um, it was a mad run, but, I, I then got a newbie in my bonnet in that we were now trying for a family and I'd not done a solo record. I'd not done an album of my own. Right. And, and I thought, well, I'm not going to have time to run, to stay with Sean and then be a dad. I didn't really know what, how much being a, becoming a parent was going to affect my free time. So I thought I've got to, I've got to lose something. I either don't do the solo record and just keep playing with Sean or I leave Sean and do, 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 do my own thing. So I planned to do a album uh, of 12 songs, 12 bars, no material, just go in the studio with a couple of guys and record it there. Try and do it really like a real honest old school kind of write the tunes in the studio, just be blues. It'll be great. And I made a bit of a mistake by hiring my brother and Roger Innes. Oh, he's and- great, great bass player. I've, I've played with him with Cliff. Yeah, great bass yeah. player. Well, the- Biggest bass pedal board I've ever seen, mind oh, you. Oh, it's but- out- Roger's <laughs> bass pedal board is outrageous. Um, <laughs> so I make this, this terrible, table. terrible mistake because as soon as the three of us start playing together, something really magical starts happening. But it's okay. not 12-bar blues. It's it's something else. It's, yeah. it's kind of a pool of everyone's influences are coming in and I, I'm having a heart attack. You know, I'm going, Oh man, yeah, I love what we're doing, but this, and, and Rog, Rog is amazing. Rog has got a really, is just his manner uh, is, is very, I find is, is really soothing, you know, and he, and he, and he was like, Oh, you don't worry about it. You know, blues is all about being honest really. And you know, this is honest music. It's coming from somewhere natural. You know, we're not manufacturing this. It, it, we are doing what you want to do, but, and I was really keen to get these influences in, especially especially Rog, because Rog has got such a, uh, a more diverse knowledge of harmony than I've got. So mm. you know, he would he would go, oh, why don't we try this here? And all of a sudden, I'd be like, oh man, yeah. And then we could go, and it became this real collaboration. Yeah. Um, and then Phil got offered the Lawrence Jones gig, which Roger was already doing. So Roger and, and and Phil couldn't turn that down. You know, it was a it was a huge opportunity for him and you know lawrence is out working loads and um all over the world you know they ended up recording in in, in america and, and all sorts of amazing stuff you know so so of course at that point it was going to be wilson brothers and we thought it would be kind of fun to do this wilson brothers so phil goes so i'm like oh i've got these songs we, we, we we've recorded 12 tunes or whatever so i end up doing the solo thing be, out of necessity it was like well i've got to it's, it's, it's got to be my own thing now because if i don't do it if i don't go out with me so you'd recorded the album and basically you then you then took it upon yourself to kind of take it out there and promote it yeah and, right. i mean roger and phil was so busy with lawrence that i, yeah. I ended up um i mean i'm very lucky i've got loads of friends who are really phenomenal musicians you know so i think the show you came to there was a, a guy called steve amadio on bass who's who's you know he's great really really or awesome. it reminds me of um tony levin and a guy called tristan paul uh, on on uh, on the drums who's really got it's, it's sort of like halfway house between bonham and um, chad smith and um 
so yeah, so we did it. We did the Dan Patlansky. So that was the first thing we did. The 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 and one of the things I will say to anybody who, who's looking to put an album out, um, put put money put money in PR. That 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 was what made the difference for me. My entire five, the last four years, four and a half years, where I've been like a pro guitarist or professional guitarist, pro makes you sound better than I am. Um, but while I've been doing this just 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 for a living. Um, has been as a result of hiring a PR guy, you know, and getting my music heard right. by people and getting getting it reviewed and and uh, you know because I yeah. had this album and I was really proud of it, you know, and I thought with the 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 really the the the, the mission statement for that record was let's eventually once we figured out it wasn't going to be twelve bar blues anymore was let's just write something we'd listen to. And here's something that might might please you. So I was talking to my band on Zoom a bit earlier. Mm -hmm. And I told them that I was going to talk to you now. And the drummer and the keyboard player both said, are you really talking to Ash Wilson? That album is fantastic. Oh, wow. That's wow. my keyboard player and my drummer. That's not even, you know, a guitar, would-be guitar hero. I'm more stunned, Bob, than you are. It's, yeah, but it's, 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 it's great. And as I say, that's not guitar players. So that's, that's fantastic. But that, that gig where I saw you, um, yeah. the O2 in Islington, Mm. Pat Lansky did something I've never seen done before, which is he, when he played a very slow blues, which did go on for a very long time, he kept on turning down and turning down and turning down until in front of an audience, 200 plus people, he had his Stratocaster turned off. Oh, yeah, it was totally off. Yeah. And the drummer was just keeping time with a very gentle clap. Mm. In normal circumstances, especially with a fashionable London audience, they'd all lose interest quickly and they'd all start jabbering at each other and what have you. It was magical. Yeah. I mean, Dan is, um, he, he's got prodigious talent, I think, really. And Dan is, he's, he's, he's playing is so unique and his sound is so unique. He's, and he's, well, one of the things that's really amazing about Danny actually is that he's as nice a guy as he is a good a guitarist. He's, he's the most warm and welcoming human being you could ever imagine. And I think that that, comes out you know when he's singing because he's when his voice is quite hoarse isn't it when he sings he's got this very hoarse kind of chris cornell yeah. thing going yeah when he plays guitar he's got this really sweet voice i think you know especially like you say on the slow blues and he has a very specific you won't tell me what value it is but he has a very specific uh treble bleed in his guitars as he turns down because I, I i remember the first sound check we did which was i think was that gig actually and um, I think that was the first show of that run of, sh run of gigs. He had this outrageous fuzz sound, like really, like you say, thick, chewy, fuzz face, Stratocaster. And then he turned down and it was like a, a hot blade, not a, not a sharp, cold blade, like a warm blade of just brightness that bloomed out of his amplifier. He was using a Dr. Z. And I was like, how is he? How has he done that? I didn't know what a trouble bleed was. And um, we, we had this discussion about fuzz faces and, and treble bleeds and the relationship. And it clearly and he really it. rides his volume all the time. All the time. All and, the time. It, and actually his tone as well, a bit. Yeah. And, and I think that, that because he does, with the solo, he does it, that, like you say, gradually drops. One of the things that I kind of uh, rely on a bit to, to stay, to not repeat myself with a group is to change dynamics, which I think is a, trick everybody really uses you know but but dan doesn't need that he's, he's one of those guys who's just tuned in to that frequency i've maybe tuned in four times he, he's there every night he tunes in and it just comes out that they, they, that band that german band he had were yeah. they were a band anyway uh -huh. so you have that sound that you know of, of three people that play together all the time with dan patlansky plonked on top of it i mean it was you really are only as good as your band sometimes, I find. I certainly, you know, I, I, and having done tons and tons of gigs with different lineups, it's amazing how different players inspire you in different ways. Dave. So, listen, bit of gear for a minute. So you're playing okay, a Strat, yeah. and I've yeah. slightly unkindly consigned you, as I certainly, when I listen to you, I hear a Strat player. But, but you, I mean, you don't just play Strats. I mean, you, I think you were, you were saying to me, you've got um, a PRS Silver Sky? I do have one of those. And, I, and I, I'm a... 
I'm and a, you're, a, you're a service a, you're guy a, apologist. <laughs> well, well, no, no need to apologise. But I mean, they, <laughs> I think people people want him to slip on a banana skin. That's the truth. Sure. But he, yeah. I mean, he, he can make some very fine guitars, but you you find it suits you. Well, I tell you what, it was. I I was I was definitely when when it was announced on the camp of oh you're joking, and I ended up trying about five over this period of time, and they were all great. I bought one, and I just bought what they had in stock. They had a white one, so I got a white one. And um, and the first gig it did was Falbard. So I tuned it down a tone, put it in a mono bag, flew to Svalbard, four flights, four planes, 26 hours, minus 15 when we land. I get to my hotel room. It's still a, still a tone down, perfectly in June. There's something to be admired in the way that company engineer... Yeah guitars you know yeah. i mean i get there is a this is definitely like an excalibur guitar you know like it like the heavens opened and the sun came down and <laughs> when, I, when i played this a lot of the gibsons i've played 50s gibsons have got a real nice sizzle in the top end mm-hmm. and i find the modern ones don't often have that and you end up changing things and and but that does you're you're, you're absolutely right i mean this this i'm sitting in front of a zoom background but let me get it right yeah my fingers on it now but this thing, that's my 58 Les Paul. Oh, God. And, oh God. and they, <laughs> they, they, they just, they're not dark and muddy. They're, they have a lightness to them, these they're 50s open. guitars. Yeah, they do. They a, really a, do. a lightness. That, you know, whoever said that, you know, a, 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 a very old Telecaster and a very old Les Paul have got some, a lot in common, and they, they really were speaking the truth. They, they, they've got this kind of lightness that means you can play around inside the note without it getting all blah, 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 blah. You know, there's, no, there's none of that low mid yeah. gunky sound, you know, and yeah, and, and th- this this definitely has, you know, it's got quite low output pickups in it. And um, so, nice. uh, well, I'll, I'll run. I'll, do you know, what? I'll run with that for. I mean, unfortunately, I did two gigs with it and then I had to come home. <laughs> well, so that's a great segue, because I was going to ask you, um, like, what, what what are you up to at the moment when? You know, people like me are pretty bloody restless and bored, but for you, it's just taken away your most of your living. So you're, you're recording yeah. again, aren't you? Yeah, in fact, we've pretty much done, actually. So ah. we're, nine, we're nine songs in, uh, and they're done, they're wrapped. So it's um, the issue we've, we've had is that the, the, the other two songs um, that we'd recorded, we had about 20, and we recorded 12 or 11, and two of them just don't sit we've got to wait for the restrictions to be lifted so that we can play because i'm very much into the rhythm track is the three of us and then overdubs are overdubs but i don't want to like do the guitar and then do it remotely you know i I want i really want it to be done as the rest of the record is because there's an energy to the album that the first one had yeah this has got as well and it's because we've recorded we recorded it together i did a i did what everybody did you know i did a few i did a few live streams on facebook i did uh i was very lucky in that my my friend wayne who who started me off writing songs um had some work come in that was that you could that we could record remotely so i i I somehow managed to flukily buy one of those ox boxes top boxes um because what i was thinking was and i took it on tour with me I, i i was we were trying to figure out how to get the stage levels down and I thought, well, if I go onto ears, I can have my volume. And because you know what the six three threes are like, you can get a great sound out of it with it barely on. You know, I was I used to use vintage amps, like sort of, you know, a lot of people, especially on the blues scene, uh, what, deluxes, supers, things like that. I had a I had a quad reverb, um, which was actually had tens in it rather than twelves. It had two EV. Uh, you know, right. those old 80s EVs in it and it had a pair of greenbacks in it as well and I had a Marshall JMP50 and I used to run the two together just at the same not wet or dry just both the same just on I had a gig rig thing that you could flick the phase so you get all the nice oh, yeah. and, and then there was, and it had a, like a ground lift on one output as well yeah. so Humdinger I recommend that if you ever want to use two amps it's phenomenal and um yeah but it was a nightmare you know my back was you know that i mean that fender quad man was in yeah the, yeah you know, way more than way way more than a 412 you know it was yeah. outrageous so i want something light it's reliable that you know yeah um 
that, I don't know, he just does. And I had this, you know, everyone everyone at the time was like, oh, two rocks, the way to go. Not the cheapest amps on the planet, are they? Well, they're not the cheapest amps in the planet, but then these aren't. <laughs> no, but I mean, they're, they're substantially more than these, you know. They are, yeah. You're looking nearly twice the money. I literally went, tried the Groove King, was like, I just have one of these. Yeah. I just have one of those. That, that'll that do. And he's like, well, I can do this. And I was like, I just, you've already built the perfect amp for me, mate. I just, when when will it be ready? You so know, it's funny. Like, it's funny. I've, I, I've had a Groove King visiting here two or three times. And I'd really like one. It's a single channel amp. Yeah. Um, you know, so I, and I, and I, my original thing was I wanted to use less pedals. And, and that, that hasn't actually happened because I've got, I'm so into Doyle Brammel. I'm a massive Doyle Brammel um, two uh, fan and his use of fuzz and univibe and, yeah. and delay and reverbs. I've really, I'm, and, and actually, you know, as, as my taste in tone has evolved over the last couple of years, and the amps just come along. It's been, it's amazing. It's very much like the, it'll just do what I yeah. need to do. And it, yeah. it's either, it's a great amp to just plug into. It's a great yeah. pedal platform. It, it... <laughs> Now, while you're on pedals, though, you, I think you use a mad professor. Do you know what? I, I'm a little bit lost without that, if I'm being brutally honest. Right. It, it, I, I've, I've been ruined by it, the, the Royal Blue. It's hardly doing anything. Yeah. But if I turn my guitar down with the amp sound, it kind of dulls down, right? Yeah. Because there's no, there's no treble bleeding here. But with, the, with this... You, you, you retain all that top end. So for those little... You get yeah. you, you get that spanky strattiness out of it. Uh, so I, I don't... It doesn't really do a lot other than it makes my volume control 
more usable yeah, on, yeah. across all my guitars really um and and it, and it doesn't color the sound there's a little bit of bottom end that's lost but when you're playing a gig anyway it's lost anyway the bassist is yeah is and then when you around. when you want to you know kick through and push in a bit more drive where do you get that from so i've got um i've, I've followed jesse davy around like a bad smell um over the years and he when he started building pedals um i got his vintage fuzz in fact i got a vintage fuzz and i got this thing called a tone switch which i've got in both my fender strats which changes the uh, impedance <laughs> i think of the pickups in that it 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 it's like a virtual long cable to <laughs> Now, if I kick it in, without it, with it, it it, it's, it barks. It's a bark yeah. all of a sudden. So it's a very easy way to kind of get into that Vaughan Albert King territory. Yeah. And when you add gain... It straight away, you know, you've got, you know, it does that whole, and there's there's four settings, so you can keep, and it just gets a bit duller but bigger. We didn't sound anything like a strat there. <laughs> What's really interesting is that with a minimum of out of hand movement, you're getting an enormous number of different sounds out that guitar. Yeah, it becomes, it, you know, it becomes a, a, a sort of a, a, a Swiss Army knife of, um, you know, for riff. I'm not doing anything on the floor. You know, it's it, it's quite a cool, it's quite a cool little thing to to use um, if you're just using one guitar. You know, it's it, it it gives you all sorts of tonal palette to play with. Really, they're all great sounds too. There's not a dud in the bag. I like the out of phase sounds to be very sort of in that knob flurry. Obviously, I'm not using fingers, but so yeah. So I've got the, the so the vintage fuzz that he released. That again is very uh, responsive to the guitar control. So if you excuse all the noise, there's something in the electrics in this room. <laughs> Go from big chew fatness to nice. Cleans up well though. Cleans up well. Yeah. So tell me, as we as we roll this to an end, tell me a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, uh, yeah, I'll ask you in this order. So who do you listen to now? Because obviously, you know, we've got the same points of reference despite our age difference. Yeah, you yeah, know, from yeah, the greats. Sure. But but who do you listen to these days? Who do you think is around there and out there and you know doing great stuff nowadays? I mean, there's there's a lot of great great guitar players that are like what I sort of say is like Instagram YouTube famous. Um, yeah. That are, that are um, I mean, there's a, there's a lad, and well, actually, Chris Buck, um, he's got his band Buck and Evans, isn't he? And, yeah. And they and they they're they're great, and they've been doing some amazing stuff. Uh, and I think his playing is just wonderful. He sort of takes like. He's sort of for me. He's kind of got that Texas blues thing going on, but but there's a lot of like Derek Trucks in his playing, um, but he does it without a slide, and he and he has this this great technique where he, he sort of, um, you know, he plays with his fingers and he tucks his pick behind his finger. And, yeah, uh, I think he's wonderful. I mean, I love the way he plays guitar. And um, uh, Chris King Robinson's another one. He kind of, you know, he's sort of in that Jesse Davy, Stevie Ray territory. Big.
a guitar sound. It's just amazing tone. I think I think for me, it, it, it's the guitarists that have a great sound. That that's really where I'm, and, and and have a bit of individuality. I'm a big Queens of the Stone Age fan, you know, and 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 I love Josh Homme's use of gear that's a little bit left of center you know it has a very angular sound it's not yeah. a round sound is it you know aggressive and i find that as i'm as i'm getting older you know um it, it it's becoming less about chops for me and more about creating a soundscape and um you know it, which is which is why it's good that i i work for other people because then i have to, <laughs> have to work on the chops to make sure everything <laughs> works um you know, when i'm doing my own stuff it, it's you know, I mean, there's a couple of songs on the new record. They, they don't have guitar solos on them. You know, they're very, they're, they're riffy. Um, but it, it's, it's, but there's some cool guitar sounds. You only have to open Instagram and write guitar. And there is, you know, there's just reams and reams of incredible guitar players. So there's loads of space. For well, and this whole new breed now, at last, I'm going to get shot down when this gets published, but at last, the women. Oh, yeah. You know, for a long time, g girls sort of stroked guitars rather than hit them. <laughs> and now yeah. they're yeah, out. I mean, I mean, you know, there's, a, there's an awful lot of super shreddy and all a bit like, I wonder what that sounds like outside of a bedroom environment kind of thing. But there are some wonderful young female players too. Yeah, really I mean, there's... Um... I mean, I obviously, when I, when I was going out on the blue scene, I, I came out when Chantel McGregor came out and JST yeah. and Joanne came out. So, and they're both two real, I mean, I mean Joanne's a really aggressive guitarist. Yeah. <laughs> so she, yeah. really, she really lays into it when she plays. What's nice is that when I was teaching, it was the same, you know, and, and, and you know, when I first started off at the college, it was, a, it was me and a room full of guys learning guitar. You know, and and then as my job progressed, all of a sudden there were more women coming through, girls right. starting to learn to play the instrument. And yeah. to wrap up, um, obviously we you know we can't we can't speculate on when we're going to get unlocked, but I guess we're going to get unlocked sooner or later. Mm. So what are your kind of you know if somebody um, fired off the starter pistol now? Yes, and said, okay, Ash, you're out. What are your short term plans? What 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 are you going to well, what are you going to do? The, you're going to finish the album. The, the, get this record finished. And take it out? And absolutely take it out. I mean, Brilliant. you know, it, it's... Um, my main squeeze, obviously, is the, is the Sari Shaw group. And um, Sari's based in the US. And, uh, you know, we, we've got, she's got a pretty good following in the UK. But it's really one, maybe two tours a year. But in the meantime, that that then I'm going to try and take the positive out of the negative of that and be like, right, well, OK, let's try and get something going in the UK, you know, get some. You know, so I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm going to, you know, employ someone to help me sell the record yeah. and um, try and get it in places where. You know, we managed to get it in some guitar magazines, Good. the last one, and we managed to get it in um, some national press. And, you know, like I say, I, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be doing any of this stuff if it wasn't really for, for, for getting this, that, you know, for getting that guy to, to do that for me. And, um, and it's the best money I've ever spent, you know, other than buying a guitar in the first place. <laughs> and um, so, and I think this record is better than the last one. Uh, in some respects, it's more of a guitar album in that it's more riffy. Uh, and it's, it, it's a collaborative one uh, again, but actually, the 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 sort of the, the the genesis of the songs sort of came from this room. So um, there, it's Roger and Phil's interpretation of the tunes I sort of sent to them. So I'm, it's a little it's a little bit nerve wracking from that point of view. In that mm -hmm. I'm like, oh well, if you know if, if the follow up doesn't match up to. The, you know the the previous one then <laughs> well ash listen i'm 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 really hopeful that we're all let out of school very soon and yeah. that that works for you and i will absolutely take you up on that beer yes but, absolutely but for now thanks ever so much for talking to me <laughs>